And we are live. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it is, wherever you are, watching this live or replay. Um, this is Art Jones. I'm the founder of The Art of Standing Out, where I'm the chief story architect. And we help businesses market better so they can sell more stuff. And today, in the Story Cafe, I'm talking to Zahra Chetty. Um, and today in the Story Cafe, we're, we're talking to somebody who has an incredible story that, that is really, really, I think it's inspiring and insightful because so many of us, we sit around and say, you know, I'm still trying to find my passion. What do I do? And maybe go off to the next thing and then off to the next thing. And, and today's conversation in the Story Cafe is whether you're a laser beam and you've decided at five years old that you were going to be a dentist and at 26 you became a dentist, or you didn't know and you flit it from one thing to another like a bumblebee or a hummingbird. The nectar has been sweet along the journey and you were wondering, what do I do with all this knowledge that I've gained? Well, Zahara Chetty can tell us how to, <laughs> how to take that, that, that knowledge that we gained how to mash it up and turn it into something amazing. So Zahara, welcome to the Story Cafe. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Um, I guess the, and, and you know what's funny is the internet's a, a, an amazing place. You, you know, we stumble upon bits and pieces of things. And sometimes we stumble upon something and we stop and go, whoa, what was that? And that's how I met Zahara Chetty. I don't know whose blog I was reading, what website I was visiting. But I looked at Zahara's profile and I was like, oh my gosh. Not only does she believe some of the things that I believe, she's so much more than that. And I mean, design thinking was the thing that I saw. That certainly is something I'm passionate about, human-centered design. She is too. Um, she has unbridled curiosity about many things. And I could see that in the profile that she had presented. And, and so do I. But when I reached out to her and really connected with her and, and listened to some of the blog posts and interviews that she's done and then looked at her website, I realized that I have to really bring her on to the Story Cafe so we can hear from her about her journey and how she's amassed such a diverse suite of experiences, uh, academic training, um, talents, I mean, on one end, she's a award-winning fashion designer. On the other end, she's a design um, savant <laughs> in, in terms of human-centered design and consulting practice. So, Zahara, um, you know, anthropology, psychology, <laughs> award-winning fashion designer, head of the department of IT as an educator, um, software developer, uh, UX designer, design thinking, sustainability, circular economy. I mean, where do I stop? <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to paint wall murals also. <laughs> <laughs> well, t tell, us, tell us how, where the curiosity springs from for you to really have gotten involved in so many different things and, and what inspires you to, 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 to gain um, mastery over one thing and then move to the next thing. I think, uh, you know, just growing up in South Africa when during apartheid and things were a little bit tough. I mean, we didn't have everything and, and just growing up in that kind of environment, you become a problem solver, right? You have to find, you know, ingenious ways of entertaining yourselves or, or making toys or, you know, with just, you know, playing in the bush, you know, people, we were left to be pretty free when we were growing up. So we had, you know, great imagination. We used to like build caves and huts and whatever and, and play with that, you know, our cousins, especially in my family, that's how it was. So you know, we were a little bit wild growing up. And I think that was very important. We were not restrained in our thinking or being, we just grew up that way. So mm -hmm. in everything we did, we had this kind of spirit of just exploring things and being curious about the world around us. And there were no rules, there were no boundaries, you know, um, in, in some ways, but in other ways, there were extreme boundaries. You know, you couldn't do a lot of things. Everybody would tell you what to do, what you're allowed to do because of, 
the way the, the situation was at the time, you know, you couldn't travel, you couldn't go to certain places, you couldn't sit on certain benches or visit certain beaches, whatever it was. Um, so there was this extreme control on one end and the, you know, the kind of freedom we had in our thinking on the other hand. Um, and I think that that's what where it started, you know, just being curious about things and imagining new ways of doing things and how things could be different, especially when, you know, it you felt oppressed or you felt like you were restrained in some way. You know, you just became, I think, rebellious. Um, and that's an important thing. You know, you don't just follow what people tell you. You, if you're not happy with the system, you know, you don't go along with it. You want to change it. Yeah. So, so you, yeah. You, you turned the apartheid experience into a negative into a positive, and and you harnessed the rebellion. It sounds like, and <laughs> and and you you found ways when you couldn't sit on that bench, you couldn't go to that beach. You and the family circle found ways to entertain yourself. It sounds like, and and that was where creativity was born. You had to find ways to be creative in order to, as a, a young person, um, bring joy into your life, right? Yeah, you you find that a lot in the, you know, in the townships and in where we grew up in the Indian townships where like, you know, people would make things and be creative and you'll find all these, you know, things going on uh, because they didn't have a lot of stuff. So there was a lot of creativity and, and I think problem solving is just born in that kind of environment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the premise for the conversation is the notion that are you a laser beam or a, a dragonfly hummingbird? Just, you know, are you straight like an arrow? Did, did you know at five years old when somebody said, Sahara, what do you want to be when you grow up? Did you have an answer for them? <laughs> you know, I think growing up in that situation, parents wanted you to be successful. So there was no option for failure, right? So everybody wanted the kids to be doctors or lawyers or engineers. So yeah, we had this laser focus where we were told what we should be when we grew up. There was not a lot of options, but, and a lot of people followed that and that was fine. But for me, I think I, you know, I listened to that for in my entire schooling career, thinking I wanted to be a doctor. But then when the time actually came, I was like having panic attacks because I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't go along with that because it would be so, you know, restraining for me because I liked so many different things. And every time, you know, at school we would have these uh, vocational tests or career guidance counseling tests, you know, aptitude tests, where you could see where you're good at. Yeah. Uh, and all of my, you know, columns would come out like straight in a line. Like I could be good at a lot of different things. So like it never helped me, you know. Um, <laughs> and then I, it was impossible for me to choose you know, whether I wanted to study one thing or the next. Um, and I think it's a lot easier if you are good at one thing, then you can just be that and you don't have to worry about other things. But I was so interested in psychology, in people, in culture, in computers, in art. And like, there wasn't something I could study where I could use all of those things. So it was giving me a lot of anxiety to just pick one of those things. And then I decided, no, I don't, I don't need to do that. I'm going to do everything. <laughs> well, you started with anthropology, though, is that right? Yeah, so I was actually studying psych, uh, no, actually, I was studying computer science and okay. fashion design part time. And then uh, one of my electives in the computer science was psychology. And then I did that. I mean, I was like, oh, yeah, I want to do a whole degree in psychology. And then <laughs> I studied psychology. And when I was doing psychology, I had to do an elective which was anthropology. I never heard of it before. Uh, you know, it's not something people like talk about uh, in that in those days. And so when I did that course, I was like, wow, this is really, really interesting. So I, I changed my major from English uh, to anthropology and I finished the entire course, uh, three year course in like two years. So I could, you know, do that. And that was like fascinating. And I really wanted to be an anthropologist, you know, go and study different cultures and everything. And I think the only thing that stopped me was that, you know, with anthropology, if you're going to study a tribe or something, you have to, you know, do participant observation where you do what they do to earn their trust and learn what, you know, what's going on there. And for me, I think my biggest phobia was like eating bugs. So <laughs> <laughs> I was like, maybe I should be a corporate anthropologist. Yeah. <laughs> so today I'd be speaking to an anthropologist digging in, exhuming old civilizations Per, if you only could eat the bugs that have to go along with, with that part of the career, that's so funny. 
but it's 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 also interesting. I think in in some of the the, the research I did before our conversation, anthropology was intriguing to you because in the apartheid system you were you were in a walled community and the walls were so high you really couldn't see what was going on outside. Yeah. You didn't know what was happening, and anthropology was kind of a portal to to experience yeah. all those things. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, so we grew up uh, in an Indian community. We went to Indian schools. We were surrounded only by ourselves. You couldn't really mix with anybody, right? So we were like curious about other people, but we weren't really, we didn't really have friends or people that we knew that we could talk to or learn about. And I still find that very problematic in South Africa right now. I mean, we still live in those communities. Just because apartheid is over doesn't mean everybody just moved around out of those townships. They're still in there. We're still living in those situations. So people really don't know about others. But when I came across anthropology and we learned how different communities live, different societies live and, you know, our common humanity, that was so important for me, you know, just to be able to experience that in some way. It's fascinating. And, and so after university, you taught for a while. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah, when I was little, right, um, I was taken and put into this, this um, kind of accelerated learning gifted kind of program where we learned about creativity and divergent thinking and all of those things and I thought you know I want to and one day I want to teach gifted kids and I always wanted to be a teacher just to like because this was so fascinating to me these skills and so while I was studying all of these other things I thought you know maybe this is my opportunity to to like share the knowledge I have and find a way to teach these things so I went uh, at the time I was teaching computer science and English and physics <laughs> Yeah, so that's what I did for a, for my day job, just to pay for my studies because I loved learning. I think that was that was the most important thing, right? I wanted to just learn things and and get paid for it. So teaching was like helping me to learn new things yeah. and, and earn money. Oh, and teaching um, had an abrupt moment in your teaching career. <laughs> I understand it, where the the after. In engagement with a couple of rowdy students, you changed your mind about being in the classroom. Is that right? Yes, I loved it. I did it for about nine years. Um, I love I love teaching, right? I love sharing knowledge. I love learning, and that's what I wanted to impart to my students. But you know, South Africa has a lot of issues and, and violence and things like that. So in schools as well, it's not just you don't just go there and teach. You know, you've got to focus more on social problems and community problems and drugs and violence and all of those things. So you spend more time doing that than, than actually teaching. And I, I was uh, assaulted by a student, you know, and and it became very stressful. You know, it was taking its toll on me. And I was like, you know, I could just be programming here. I could like, you know, just go in and uh, sit in front of my computer the whole day and, and not have the stress to deal with. So that's what I did. You know, it took me a, a quite a, a long time to think about that. And, but I had to you know, just for my own health and my own sanity. You know, I couldn't, I wasn't trained to be a riot policeman, so I didn't know how to handle the violence. <laughs> well, yeah. it's, it's, it sounds like with almost a decade in, in academia as a teacher, it sounds like it was fulfilling. It's something you'd always wanted yeah. to do. It, it, but the, the hard part was you said you weren't trained to be a, a riot police person. So, um, and I know here in America, we have the same challenges in, in, in schools where, you know, you just never know who the student is that's going to pop off in the wrong way, and it, it it can be challenging. the The next part of your journey from academia to corporate life and 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 leveraging your your technology experience in in computer science, you you went to a software development company. Is that right? Yeah, so I was teaching programming at the time. Uh, so I went to a software development company and I thought, yeah, I could just program there because I know how to program. I've been teaching kids to program. Yeah. So I thought it'd be pretty easy. And it, it was. And I, I think the biggest disappointment for me was that, you know, we took so much of pride in teaching kids, that, you know, how to code and to solve these problems. And we go there and like everybody's just Googling <laughs> how to code, you know. So, yeah, that was uh, strange for me. It's it's but but it sounds like there was in the coding there's the the user interface and that it's kind of where you you yeah. you got a glimpse of what UX was all about and it sounds like it was pretty intriguing to you. So I was teaching human computer interaction, you know, while I was teaching programming, and uh, you know, 
so that was ingrained in me the whole process and then when i actually went into the real world in software development i think there was a lot of emphasis on actually just the coding and so developers are really great they're really smart and they you know there's such a pride i think when they develop something complex and then they can't figure out why nobody thinks it's also so great you know but when you look at it the people that are on the user you know using the stuff don't really get it or they don't you know they have problems figuring it out because they're not so smart um so <laughs> so i think they didn't so I, that was at the time it was just the beginning of ux and design and that kind of thing so it was pretty pretty easy for me to just go and start the design phase and i ended up doing that in a lot of different companies where they were starting a design team in their software development team and because I had computer, human computer interaction and psychology and anthropology, it was pretty easy for me to use that knowledge just to go ahead and, and develop their UX for them. So anthropology, psychology, and, and user design gave you the ability to think about the user in a really um, insightful and thoughtful yeah. way to build better product interfaces for them. And it sounds like that, that reaching into the user community and, and being able to kind of define exactly what is gonna serve them and not just do it in an implicit way, because you'd think that way, but explicitly really reaching out to them and saying, I wanna build this and this is how it's gonna work. Is that how you would use it? And getting that collaborative co-creation thing going on. Um, it sounds like your design process probably included that a little bit as well. So initially, you know, it was just about um, fulfilling the business needs, you know, getting more users to click, getting more users to visit the sites and that kind of thing. Um, and it still is that way with a lot of companies. But the more work I did, the more I realized, you know, sometimes we're designing things that have long term negative effects on the entire community that it's supposed to be serving. Right. And I did a lot of studies into persuasive design and, and that kind of thing, you know, behavioral design. And the problem for me was businesses were trying to use these techniques to get more people to use their sites and their products but the effects of that were actually negative on the people and it was an ethical question for me whether i should actually be involved in that and i couldn't do that because i'm contributing to something that's going to damage the community or the entire society or the environment and and that's i think where conscious design came about where we have to like actually be aware of what we're doing and what we're designing. And I think there's not a lot of space for us to do that when we're in business because it's all about the numbers, the analytics, the how many people are buying. It's all about sales, right? Um, and we don't think about the long-term effects that we can sell now and get the money, yeah, but we're also destroying our planet and our people along the way. Uh, you know, we need some balance. Yeah, and I think, you know, you were discovering what, what Google and Amazon and Apple and Facebook were, were, were knowing but not sharing with the community is that they were building great products, but uh, tablets and iPhones and all the tools that they were building, they weren't letting their children use them hmm. because they knew how addictive it was. And yeah. um, you know the same methodology that is used to design a slot machine in a casino it's the same endorphin rush that we get when we swipe and pinch the screen of that beautiful tablet or, or, or mobile device that we use. And it can be addictive. And so I, I appreciate you for acknowledging that and kind of pulling back from that kind of software development to be more socially responsible. But social responsibility didn't stop there in, in your evolution, in your journey, because it, you now as it shows there on the screen, is a Tahara Chetty, founder of the African Futures Academy, which I just think is amazing because the, the concepts that are baked into the African Futures Academy are what the world needs now. And um, can you share a link with me and I could bring it okay. up on the screen and as I bring it up on the screen, perhaps you can talk a little bit about what um, you've included. And the, the chat is. Is it showing? Yep. Because, you know, Zahara is, I, I think she's like the, the, the sun in our universe, right? She's a center. 
And African Futures Academy is just one of the planets that revolves around her. But it is a planet that coalesces all of her passions and all of her experiences. And in a way that she, her goal is to bring that mindset to the leaders of business and, and NGOs and wherever to, to be more socially responsible, to be more committed to um, nurturing um, society and people in it, um, the earth and all the flora and fauna on it. Um, and I, I'm paraphrasing, I think, how Zahara thinks of that, but um, she's put a link in the chat, not yet. It's, it's the... Um... Is it? Uh, oh, there it is. I'm so used to um, seeing Zoom screen that I didn't even know where to look for a chat on. Okay. I didn't know where to look for a chat on StreamYard. Let's see. Can you see my screen? Sahara? Sahara, can you see my screen? Uh oh. Did I break it? There you are. Yes, sorry. Yes, I can hear you. Um, do you see my screen or do you see, what do you see there? I can see your screen, yes. Is my screen's got a lot of things going on it and I don't know how I'm gonna get just. Yeah, you have two windows open. Well, let's see. Why is that minimized and over here it's... Yeah, you can just show that one. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it here and I'm just in, so you're seeing the entire website now. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to let you speak to what we're seeing and describe it um, for us and how to navigate the site as we go through it, if you would. So we just basically started the site a couple of months ago, right? It's a, we, it's a culmination of a couple of years of research that we've been doing in education and the systems governing it, so all over the world. So I've been consulting with a lot of different companies overseas, not in South Africa, uh, about you know using technology and digitizing education and e-learning and all of those kinds of things. But the more research I did into that, it's not just about putting your current content online like we're trying to do now during COVID. It's about the kind of skills and the thinking and the mindset and the culture that people need to, to live in the future. So what is education about, right? It's about preparing people to live in society in a way that they can contribute effectively to it. And if we think about it, if we look around, what really are we teaching our kids? You know, What are they gonna contribute to? So especially in Africa, I mean, if we look at the education system, it was never designed for everybody to succeed. It was always some elitist, very um, restrictive, very, uh, what's the word? It wasn't <laughs> for everybody, right? It was, it was only about the select few that go to university and get these jobs. And what happens to the 90% of people? They end up unemployed or they have to figure out something, how to carry on with their lives. So we're not giving them the right skills that they need to become effective citizens of the future. Right, and the future is changing. We know it's so volatile. So many things are happening. There's a lot of things that we're going to have to deal with in the future. And we are not teaching the kids these skills to deal with that. And it's not just about subjects. It's not just about, you know, doing maths and English and whatever subjects we have to do in school. You know, knowledge kids can gain from anywhere now. You don't even have to be in a class to get that. You can, anything you want to know, you can Google it. You can download a book. You can listen to a podcast. You can watch a video. But the actual thinking skills behind that, you know, what you do with that knowledge is so missing in our education system. And I think the people who are, are the most impoverished, the most disadvantaged, the most 
you know, marginalized, those are the people that actually need these skills to go and help themselves to improve their lives and their societies and their communities, because nobody's gonna come and save them. You know, we can't always wait for government or whoever, I don't know, some savior to come and fix things for us. And if we look around, that's what is happening in this, in our country, especially where we think we, everybody sits around and waits for the government to fix things. But what, you know, what this African Futures Academy is about is, is creating opportunities for kids to learn these skills. It's about the next generation. I mean, in Africa, we have the youngest median age on the planet. And in the next couple of years, that is gonna be you know, the biggest economy around. And if they don't have the right skills to develop themselves and their communities and their economies, what's gonna to happen to this entire continent? So we wanna develop these skills now and get it to as many people as possible and we're having those conversations. So in the past three months since we've started the African Futures Academy, we've been talking to lots of people, different organizations, different uh, people who are just interested in the future of Africa and how we can change that. So we're on this trajectory where, you know, the governments were creating um, this road for us, this roadmap, but even in the past that hasn't worked for us. We want to create our own path. We have a right to create the kind of futures that we want to live in. And we want people to be able to think about that consciously and develop their own futures and imagine new things and be creative and put their passion and problem solving into that. And this is uh, a space that we've created to explore those different options and these skills. And we're working on a lot of culture changing projects. Like we're working on a, a future skills workbook that we want to get to kids because you know in Africa infrastructure is a problem. Not everybody's online learning. There's not everybody's not in a digital school. So offline is also something we have to look at. We're looking at games. We're looking at apps. We're looking at lots of different ways of learning these skills and just getting it out to as many young people as possible and collaborating with whoever we can collaborate with. Yeah. So basically, this is the starting point for that. <laughs> That's amazing. I. Um... I, you know, how impressed I am with this. I, I think that it's it, it's the African Futures Academy, but I think that uh, young people, old people, people in the middle in between, all need to have a visibility into how to leverage the kind of concepts that you present here in the this matrix of 21st, 21 future skills for the 21st century citizen. Certainly it, your, your mission sounds like it's focused on young people, but all people need, Yeah. if you're going to live through all the volatility, uncertainty, chaos, and ambiguity of the, this, this new millennia that we're 20 years into. And the, the pace of change is quickening at such a pace that Digital Darwinism used to be something you could just kind of look out your window and say, hey, digital Darwinism, how are you doing? Now, if you don't keep up with the digital technology, you clearly can be left behind because 5G is going to change everything. And then there's AR and VR and the Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything where your your Fitbit or your, your iPhone on your wrist will take your your heart rate as you walk to your car from your office and it will know your heart rate's elevated so you must be a little anxious, didn't have a good meeting. So your phone communicates with your refrigerator and chills the white wine because that knows that always calms you down, turns the smooth jazz on so when you walk in the house <laughs> that you, you will be able to calm down that your phone is doing that for you without you even having to ask it. That's the world that is not tomorrow, it's happening now, it's just not widely distributed. Um, and you are providing the skills that we all need to be considering as uh, to nurture, to assure um, the quality of life that we and the people nearest and dear to us, including our, our, our customers and internal customers, uh, need to, to know how to, to leverage and nurture. I'm trying to see how I can stop this to share. <laughs> And mm. there it is. now it's just us, we're back. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we started, you know, with the focus on kids, but the more we, we 
started talking to people, the more we realized, yeah, the people who really need that now is everybody. Because, I mean, the, the, the job market is changing. Careers are changing. People need to know how to shift from one thing to the next, to shift online, to start their own businesses, you know, to be uh, future-proof, uh, you know, so yeah. to adapt to change. Because and, that's happening really fast. And, you know, I've, I've only become aware of the term VUCA in the last two years. VUCA has been around for a long time. It's a military term. And business adopted it um, because, you know, I worked at Xerox Corporation for a, a long time. And, and Xerox is a classic example like Kodak and Circuit City um, that, that suffered with digital Darwinism, right? They, they, they fell in love with one technology. They kept one in the closet that they didn't bring forward because the, the golden goose was this other technology. Like Kodak had digital cameras, but they liked selling film. Um, Xerox had Xerox had everything that we use in technology <laughs> today, um, but they literally gave it to Microsoft and Apple um, because they loved toner and paper, which was the copier side of the business. Businesses that don't adapt perish. And, and I think businesses and people and brands are alike the humanization of the brand um if we don't adapt um we become become irrelevant or we simply perish and and the tools that you've baked into the african futures academy are the kinds of tools that teach you how to think differently how to see patterns and if seeing patterns was a pill that we could take it would be so important right now because we're in the middle of a, a, a pandemic that's wreaking havoc on the economies of the world, um, the mental health of the people of the world. Yeah. And, and because of that, markets are changing and the people in those markets are changing and being affected. So this, the, this confluence of volatility, uncertainty, and chaos can be maddening or it can be a puzzle that you can seek to solve for. And when you see the patterns and you can see what June of 2020, 2021 looks like, you can plot a course to get there. You can't change the pandemic. Like a ship, you can change your sails to still navigate to a goal that you want to achieve. But you do it best when you have the kind of skill sets that Zahara and her colleagues are, are gathering to share with people that need them now more than ever. So Zahara, thank you for founding the African Futures Academy. Are you bringing it to North America or are you just gonna keep it in South Africa? So look, it's on the internet, anybody can access it. We <laughs> wanna get these skills to as many people as possible, but you know, charity begins at home. So <laughs> we would <laughs> like to really, really, you know, be able to, you know, get sponsors or people who are interested to help us get these these tools, you know, for the future to as many um, underprivileged and marginalized members of the community as possible, because, you know, typically these kinds of education things and, and about the full IR and, and new technologies and even these skills are pretty much, you know, in elite schools and things which most people don't have access to. And I think that is the biggest problem we're trying to solve. Is the African Futures Academy a 501c3, what we call a nonprofit here in the so it's a social enterprise. We have one part that you know is for profit, and then we have another part that is not for profit. So, so as a not for profit, you essentially are making available the the value of the academy to a certain segment of the, the children and whoever in South Africa can benefit from it. Yeah, we want to reach as many people as possible. How how can people here listening live or on replay support the initiative? So we're working on a lot of projects. We're working on, on books, on workbooks, on apps, on games, uh, even digital games and also board games. Uh, you know, so people, because I mean, people could use it in the classroom. Kids could have these with them. Not everybody has access to a mobile phone or a device or Wi-Fi here. I mean, you know, NASA and Nokia are putting LTE on the moon, but I mean, in Africa, we still don't have access. <laughs> so we're working on lots of different projects and, you know, anybody who's interested, any organizations that want to sponsor, you know, any of these things to get access to more students, more people as possible in Africa is welcome to contact me, you know, on LinkedIn or through the website and we can see how we can collaborate with that. Fantastic. Aren't you doing a Kickstarter as well? Yes. So we're 
at the moment we're busy, really, really busy on our new, our latest book, right? It's a work skills, uh, 21st century work skills book that we want to get to as many students in Africa as possible, starting with South Africa, um, you know, especially in, in, in underprivileged schools. So we want like to, so for every book, you know, that we sell, uh, we're going to donate a certain portion of those to give them free to underprivileged kids. And that's gonna be available. You can pre-order it from Kickstarter, I think from December. Yeah, so we're just um, sorting that out right now. So we're really busy with designing that and it's gonna be really, you know, culture changing, I think. It's not just a textbook or something like that. It's very, it's a lot of art and design and it's really, really interesting. It's something you'd really wanna look at. Well, um, for everybody listening live and on replay, we're talking to Zahara Chetty. Uh, of South Africa, a founder, an educator, uh, award-winning fashion designer, a multi-potentiality person who just does everything so well and does everything that, to make meaning in other people's lives. And the, the link I just put on the screen um, is to the African Futures Academy so you can learn more about it. Um, there, there is a what we call a 501c3 here in the States and, and there's another name for it in South Africa, but essentially it's the same thing where you're doing um, you're you're doing good by 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 delivering good value to, to people that need it, and if listening you you want to contribute or or support in any way, there's the link. There's Sahara. It's a great initiative. We should all um, be supporting these kinds of uh, value added things to help the world become a better place. So thank you, Sahara. Um, thank you for having me on the show. A absolutely. I I still have questions about all that you do. I'd love to have you back at some point. Um, at your when your busy schedule permits, um, send me that calendar link and and I'll <laughs> and we'll do it again. Um, because I'm sure in in a month or so the the academy will have evolved and there'll be more value that we can talk about. Or there'll be another initiative that you've launched with some collaborators to bring more value to the world. So, um, yeah, I'd love that. Well, fantastic. Let's make it happen. Um, any any final words? Any events or anything that that you can tell us about that we should know about? Uh, there's lots of stuff. Just you know, like follow us on social media to just stay updated because there's so much happening. I you know I can't <laughs> even <laughs> mention them right now. But yeah, this is just one of the projects that we're working on and. Every day we just get more and more collaborators in the space, and it's just really, really important that that you know we all put our effort into making this world a better place. I know it sounds corny, but yeah, this is the perfect time to do that. You know, when everything's in chaos, that's a perfect time to change it and mold it into what you want the future to be. Making the world a better place is certainly a, an initiative we can all get behind. So again, thanks for the work that you do. Thanks for everybody listening live and on replay. My name is Art Jones. I'm the founder of The Yard of Standing Out, where we talk to standout individuals who are making amazing changes in the world. And today, Sahara Chetty was our guest, and she's one of those people that stand out. So thank you, Sahara. Thanks, everybody, for thank tuning you. in. Thank you. Until next time, bye for now.